All right. Welcome everybody to number six of our lectures on uh, functional programming. And today I want to start by pointing you at the best paper ever written on functional programming. That's called Why Functional Programming Matters. This paper is from 1984, um, written by John Hughes. Um, I can recommend all his papers. But this paper is especially influential for me because it explains exactly why pure lazy functional programming matters. And the reason is what he says, he uses the analogy of building a chair. If you're building a chair out of a single block of wood, that's really, really hard because you have to kind of carve that chair and it becomes very brittle. Instead, what you want to do is you want to build the chair in a compositional way. You want to take, you know, legs built from this material and a seat built from that material and easily stick them together. And that compositionality is exactly what you get from lazy, pure functional programming. Laziness allows you to not care about evaluation order. So we have seen many, many examples like that where we generate an infinite list and then take the first n elements or zip that with a finite list. Lazy evaluation makes that possible. You don't have to think, oh gee, when I write this expression that list is infinite so this will never terminate. No, lazy evaluation, what it will do is it will just pick enough elements from that list to make it work. The other thing is purity. If you want to compose things in arbitrary order, you don't want to worry about side effects. Do the side effects effects happens twice or once, and again, pure functional programming gives you that. Today's lecture, we will talk about recursive functions, but really what today's lecture is about is about why functional programming matters. So let's um, not um, waste any more time and jump right into the lecture. We have seen many, many functions defined in terms of other functions. And here's our cliché factorial. Excuse me for people that are getting, you know, tired of the factorial, but factorial is the best friend of functional programmers because it's a function that illustrates a lot of concepts in a very short um, uh, area. So let's look at factorial here. It's a function from int to int. And how do we define it? Well, we define it in a compositional way. We say, let's first generate a list from 1 to n, and then take the product of that list. So here you see, think of that chair, we're taking a list of numbers, we're generating that, and then we're taking the product. And um, we can even make it more extreme, because if you look at that um, 1 to n, we can write it like this. We could say, give me the product of take n of the list of the infinite list of numbers starting at 1. So here you see what I mean by compositionality. I take an infinite list, I take the first n elements, and then I compute the product of that. This is something that you couldn't do in a strict language because then this would not terminate and the whole thing would fall apart. Uh, instead of returning the factorial, it would never terminate. And another thing that I've shown you many, many times is how lazy evaluation allows you to evaluate expressions by equational reasoning. So let's run here through the way that factorial 4 can be evaluated. We start with the factorial 4 and we just unfold its definition. So factorial was defined as the product of 1 to n, factorial of n. In this case, n equals 4, so we just substitute 4 for n, and we get a product of 1 to 4. Now we unfold the definition of 1 to 4, that's the list 1, 2, 3, 4. Equally well, we could have um, unfolded the definition of product. Because we're in a lazy language, the order of evaluation doesn't matter. This might be or might not be the evalu uh, evaluation order that the Haskell interpreter or compiler uses. We're just using the one that's simplest for us here. And then we knew that product was of a list is, you know, just multiplying each of the elements. 
So this is one way to evaluate uh, the, the factorial of 4. Now let's look at a slightly different way to write that um, function. Let's write the product function and let's write that out. So product takes a list of numbers and returns a number and it does that by multiplying the numbers in that list. Well, since we have to start with the list, we have to look at the first argument. That can be the empty list. Well, what is the product of the empty list? What is a good choice for that? I would say, let's make that 1. And why is that? Because 1 is the neutral element of multiplication. n times 1 equals n for all n. So it's okay, the empty list doesn't do anything, so let's uh, make the product of the empty list 1. And now we can define the product of a list x cons x's, where we use pattern matching over the list, to be x times the product of x's. Now we have defined product as a recursive function using pattern matching over a list. If you don't like the fact that the uh, product of the empty list is 1, you might also say, well, I make this a partial function that I don't define on empty lists, so it must be a list of at least one element, and I can just say the product of a list containing one element is the element itself. It's up to you. I think it's convenient to just say the product of the empty list is 1, and then you see when the recursion ends here, it ends with times 1 and everything is dandy. Given this definition of product, I will erase it here, we can take the same expression, factorial of 4, factorial of 4, and expand it in a slightly different way. So we say factorial 4 is the product of 1 cons 2, cons 3, cons 4, empty list. We have seen this in previous lectures, that this is just an abbreviation for 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and now we're applying the definition of um, product. Uh, and we're just saying, okay, well, what is that? That is product of something on top that was 1 times product of 2 cons, 3 cons, 4, I have to get my parents right, etc. And now I can take this step by step. So this is a, a slightly more involved um, computation of the, of the factorial of 4, but that's how you do it in Haskell. You can just think of your computation as just unfolding every function definition in whatever place you want until you get the uh, final answer. And in this case, for those who didn't know, the factorial of 4 is 24. Just like I've shown you here how to write product um, using recursion, we can of course write the factorial function itself using recursion. Factorial of 0 equals 1 and the factorial of n plus 1. Remember from lecture, I think it was lecture 4, where we call this n plus k pattern, equals n plus 1 times the factorial of n. Here I define the factorial in terms of pattern matching directly on numbers. And here you see that the recursive structure of factorial is very similar to the recursive st structure of product. Now I'm adding, giving you some homework that's not in this uh, lecture. 
And the homework is as follows. You have defined factorial using recursion. And let's call that recursive factorial. And you define factorial using product. Now your homework is to prove that these two are the same. So you have to prove that factor factorial using product, so product of 1 to n equals recursive factorial of n. And there are several ways that you can go ahead and uh, prove this to yourself. Uh, an obvious way is to use induction over numbers here, but what's much nicer is to prove this by using calculation, by proving that you can derive, that you can simplify this definition to synthesize the recursive function. And that's a very, very powerful way that people do functional programming. You write a specification and then you derive an implementation by, by using um, equational reasoning. And hopefully we'll get um, in chapters 13 and so on, we talk much more about how we can synthesize programs, def uh, implementations from specifications. And in order to learn that, to learn the tricks, the, the techniques, and I shouldn't use tricks because it's not tricks, like induction is not a trick, it's a kind of a fundamental toolbox that you have, a tool in your toolbox, how you can do these kind of um, program derivations. And even if you're not using functional programming in your day-to-day -day work, you can still use these techniques of starting with a, with a complicated program but that's, or a complicated program, I should say, an inefficient program that's not complicated, that's obviously correct, and then massage it into an efficient implementation that might be complicated, but you know now that that thing is correct because you've derived it from the specification. That's a very, very um, common technique in functional programming. So in this case, when we execute factorial, we see that it's much uh, more along the lines what I just show, showed with uh, product. And that should be a hint of how you can define, uh, or how you can transform this definition into that definition. Because you see that when you unfold the computation, the computation is exactly the same. So if I unfold this one and I unfold that one, it's exactly the same. So now how can you prove that without unfolding that definition for every n? That's your exercise. Now here's an, an interesting um, observation. If you define factorial using pattern matching, as I just saw, this function is, is partial. So it will just... Um, continue to e execute when you do factorial of zero because it matches, oh, I, I should not have gone further but uh, back, but if you look at this thing, if I apply this to a negative number, it will just go on and on in an infinite recursion. Okay, why is recursion useful? Well, in Haskell, we don't have loops. Uh, in, in an imperative language like C Sharp, you define a lot of functions, you hardly ever use recursion. You usually use a loop. You use a while loop, a for loop, a for each loop. Imperative languages have many, many ways to do iteration. In a language like Haskell, there is no really way, built-in way to do iteration, so you're using recursion. But the goal of recursion and loops is exactly the same. You want to define something in terms of itself. That's what the loop does. It kind of you know, repeats a computation and something gets smaller. The loop variable or when you for each over a loop, you're picking out the next element. That's exactly what a recursive definition tries to do. You're trying to define a function in terms of 
a smaller version of its argument. And given the mathematical basis of Haskell, you often uh, use that to um, prove things by induction. And we all know induction from our math classes, um, and that has a very direct uh, influence here on the way you define functions. So really you're not de defining your functions by recursion, you're defining them inductively. Here's another example, we've seen this already, product. Product of the empty list is one, product of a list n, concatenated with n's, is n times the product of n's. Here you see that I'm defining this function by induction over the list, uh, or as a recursive function over that list. But when I say induction, I mean that I've, I've given you all the cases on the left hand side, empty or a list of n on top of n's, and then on the right hand side, I'm calling that function on the remainder of the list. And let's run through this again. Product, I've seen this on the whiteboard a little bit before. I'm just unfolding the definitions at each point. Just unfolding, that's the way you reason about uh, pure functional programs. Let's compare that with how you deal with a program in C-sharp. What you usually do there is you put a breakpoint in your code. In order to observe the behavior of your a running program, you put a breakpoint and you look at the state of the program at each breakpoint. That's a fundamentally different way of viewing at execution than in a pure language. In a pure language, you look at your expression and it, it unfolds, it just executes and you can f you know, expand definitions until you get something that is your final value. In an imperat imperative language, you go and you, your program counter steps through your program and you stop and then you look at the state of your program. You look at your call stack, you look at the values of other um, variables, but there's no kind of you know, general expression that, that kind of grows in all directions like the one that you see here on the slide. It's a, it's a very different mindset of how you think about computation. And I, and I see that um, now where it pays off is when you're looking at link. Link um, also has lazy evaluation. If you're doing I enumerable, that is deferred execution. If I have a query here, var, let's do this, var q equals from x in x's, where x divided by zero equals five, select x. Now, because of deferred execution, this division by zero won't happen when I execute this assignment, because everything is deferred, so it will just happen. And now when I say, you know, for each var z in q, now here that exception will happen. But if I would have put a breakpoint here, my program would have stopped here, but I wouldn't have seen that thing happening. And if you look in Visual Studio, it says, oh, if you expand the value of this uh, query, it will cause execution here. And there you see that like lazy valuation and breakpoints don't really match because now I'm, the fact that I'm breaking the expression here and looking at the result changes the behavior of my program. Some exception happens here instead of here. Whereas well, I was debugging because I saw an unexpected exception here. And now I still don't know, was that exception the same as here or here? The fact of debugging has now changed the, the meaning of my program. It's like a Heisenberg, right? It's like looking at the cat, um, you know, changes the, or looking at the experiment changes the, uh, the outcome. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm looking at this thing and I'm changing the outcome because the exception happens here and not here. Very, very different than in a lazy, pure language where you can always watch at the values of expressions and it doesn't matter 
when you do that. And that's the point that John Hughes makes in why functional programming matters. Okay, next function is length. Um, you see that it has very, very similar structure as product. Very, very similar. It is defined by induction over a list. So the empty list, the length of that is zero. The length of a list of something a, a const onto another list is one plus the length of the remainder of the list. A very, very similar structure and we will see in later lectures how we can abstract from that structure because it's kind of getting boring. If you're seeing the same pattern all over again, we want to define a higher order function, a function that captures this recursion pattern. Um, and again, we can do that because we can abstract from values because the order of evaluation doesn't matter. This preparing for lecture seven. In a lazy language, what you can do is if you have an expression, a complicated expression, and you see another complicated expression, and you see that they are really the same, except, um, I should make them look the same. If the only difference between these two expressions is in these two places, what I can do is I can define a function f x y equals, and I can replace that thing here by x and that expression by y. And now I can take these two big expressions and just replace them by applying them to the values that I pulled out of these things. So in this case that guy, let me draw them here, so that's that one and that is that one. So I can always take a complicated expression. If I see something that I've seen before, I can abstract from the differences, define a new function and then just recreate this big expression by passing these things that I have abstracted out. That is only possible because of lazy evaluation and purity. Because I assume that the evaluation of the parts here does not depend on the things that I pulled out of that big expression. May sound really abstract, but I'm, I bet you that in the next lecture when we talk about higher order functions, this all makes sense. Just want to put this picture in your head of the notion of abstraction, of par parameterization, where I take a complicated expression, another complicated expression, I look at what is common between them or what is different, and then I factor out the things that are different and define a new function. And what we will see is we'll, what we will do is we'll see a lot of these recursive functions over lists that are all the same. The only thing that they are different in, like in this example, is what is the value of the empty list and what do you do with the, the element when you have the kind of non-empty case with the element and the result of the recursive call. That's the only difference that you see. All right, let's uh, evaluate this exp expression here. And this should be kind of boring by now, or just unfolding that expression. But again, this is preparing for next week, because here you see in this recursive unfolding, you see the same pattern. Um, with product, we saw the first element of the list times the product of the rest, and here we say one plus the recursive call. So you, you see this repeating pattern here and in the next lecture we will introduce higher order functions to abstract from those common patterns. Another one, reverse. I'm going to bore you to death by giving you example after example of a recursive function over lists that all does the same thing. Says what you do for the empty list. It gives you a case for what to do with a list that's not empty in terms of the recursive call to the remainder of the list. And in this case, when you want to reverse a list, well, the empty list is already reversed. If you want to reverse a list with x on top of x's, you reverse that list and you stick x's at the back. Uh, and that's exactly what this definition says. So, unfold this again. 
reverse one, two, three. I just applied the definition of reverse, which says the reverse of one cons two, three is the reverse of two, three with one stuck on the back. And now I do the same again. The reverse of two before three is the reverse of three with two stuck on the back. So you see that here. And then the reverse of three is three stuck on the back of the reverse of empty. And the reverse of empty was empty. So we've now unfolded the whole recursive cold chain. And we ended up with empty, concatenated with three, concatenated to two, concatenated with one, which is three to one. So you see here how by equational reasoning I can compute the value um, of reverse one to three uh, into three to one. I think in the closure um, channel nine interview with Brian and uh, um, what is David Hickey? Rich. 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 Um, Brian mentions the paper why calculating is better than scheming. That's another uh, interesting paper that shows the power of calculational programming um, that we do here all the time. We've seen zip um, in the previous lecture. Let's define zip using a uh, recursive definition as well. Remember the type zip takes two lists, list of A, list of type of B, and returns a list of pairs. The list, the zip of an empty list and whatever other list is the empty list. As we said, zip terminates as soon as either of its input lists terminates. So the zip, if I zip an empty list with whatever the second list is, I return the empty list. If I zip something with an empty list on the right hand side, well, I return the empty list as well. So that um, takes care of the base case. Now we know that in the third case, we have two non-empty lists because the first one, first definition, first class takes care of the empty list as the left list. The second one takes care of the empty list as the second list. So now I have two non-empty lists. One starts with X, the other one starts with Y. I just take a pair of X and Y and then I zip the results of, and I const that on the zip of the remainders of these lists. Super easy, super easy. Again, just looking at the structure of these types and at the, the structure of the arguments and the, the structure of your type, you have no choice. You know exactly what you need to do. I get two lists, I need to create a list of pairs. Well, I know what a list is, so I just look at the structure, define it by pattern matching, and it just falls out. That's the beauty of using a pure language with pattern matching like this. Now, try as homework, extra homework, to define zip for enumerables. That's not as easy because on enumerables I cannot do pattern matching. Bart de Smet has a very nice blog post. If you want to cheat, you can uh, read his blog post. He has a very long blog post on how to define zip. But the problem really, what it boils down to is that if you use I enumerable, you have to iterate over these two lists um, simultaneously. That's what you see here in the third class. I have a list X on top of X's and Y on top of Y's. I take the first two elements and then zip over the rest. C Sharp makes it easy to iterate over a single list with for each. If I want to for each over a single list, I can just say for each X in X's and use that. But C Sharp doesn't give you a way to iterate over two lists. So what you have to do is you have to implement the logic underneath for each yourself. So you have to do get enumerator on the two lists and call move next on both lists and make sure that if move next returns false, then you know that one is empty. So you're encoding this whole pattern matching using um, calls to move next and get enumerator and so on. And that definition will look a lot uglier than this one. But that doesn't really matter because once you have defined zip, now everybody else can use it. 
you can forget about the definition. So even if the definition of zip doesn't look pretty in C sharp, I don't care because all the consumers of zip can use it in a nice way with the same signature as we have here. Plus it will be now in uh, Visual Studio 2010, it will be in the BCL so um, we, uh, it's already taken care of. Nobody has to define zip and everybody can use it. Still, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, let's go and do a couple more um, recursive functions. This one we have seen uh, a couple of times, taking a list and dropping the first n elements. This is a function that's also in uh, the link standard sequence operators. Um, so, how do we define that? Well, if I have to drop zero elements from a list, well, obviously I have to return that same list. If I have to drop whatever many elements from the empty list, I return the empty list. That's also obvious. So the remaining case says that if I have to drop n plus one elements from a list that starts with some element, I don't care what that element is because I'm going to drop it, and a remaining list, well, I need to drop n elements from that remaining list. It's a very, very natural way to specify what it means to drop the first n elements of a list. If you write this function in C sharp where you don't have pattern matching, what you have to do is you have to do a um, for each with a counter or for loop or something, it, it looks um, slightly more complicated than this beautiful um, recursive definition. But again, does it really matter? Not really, because everybody that uses drop doesn't care how that drop was defined. All they care about is that they have a function that takes a number and a list and returns a new list and they can compose those together. So, defining functions using um, pattern matching and recursion is nice, but it's not essential. Because most users will never define functions like this, they will just glue together a, a library of functions and they don't define these things that are defined either in the .NET BCL or in the Haskell prelude. That's exactly why these functions are in the prelude or in the BCL, because they are nasty to define. Okay, last one, appending two lists. Uh, that's a, a beautiful full one too. Like if I append the empty list to another list, well, that's the same as the second list. If I want to append a list that starts with x and then has access to a list y's, well, the result is a list that has access and then access appended to y's. That's a very, very natural inductive way to define um, appending of lists. This one, if you do the append, um, you can write this one quite nicely using um, for each and iterators in C sharp. Uh, that's that's a, a one where I think the definition in C sharp actually looks a little bit nicer than the uh, definition here because you don't have to, um, in this case you only do induction over one list, the first one, right, and looking for the empty list and the non-empty case. And if you do only induction over one list, that usually uh, means that you can define it using a for each. And if you return a list, that usually means that you can use it using iterators, that you can use yield return. I'm going to do the homework uh, myself. So if I want to append two lists, I just say for each X in, I oh know I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll leave that to you. I shouldn't give away all the homework uh, beforehand. Um, this one is, is too much fun to, to write yourself. Um, what I want to say um, is that in the first lecture, people, when the exercise was to define um, quicksort, a lot of people used append there too. 
The, the problem with append is that if you're appending a lot of lists you, and you do it in this way, you get a quadratic behavior. Um, so instead of um, kind of you know writing this exercise out, I'm just adding another piece of homework um, and saying is how do you define append in a more efficient way, such that you can append lists in linear time instead of quadratic time. Uh, that's a classic exercise um, for, for, for lists and there's a, a lot of interesting ways to do that. All right, quicksort, our favorite example. Um, was the homework for uh, lecture one. So let's uh, have a look at the uh, quick sort here. This is how we define it in Haskell. Um, quick sort takes a list of ints uh, and returns a list of ints. If I have to sort the empty list, obviously it's empty. If I have to sort a list that starts with x and has a remainder x's, what do I do? Well, I have to take all the, if I can take all the elements that are smaller than x and put them on the left, take all the elements that are larger than x, put them on the right, and then stick x in the middle, I'm done with sorting. Recursively, right? I know that now the left side is sorted and they're all smaller. I know that the right ones are all bigger and sorted, and then I know that the whole list is sorted. How do I find all the elements that are smaller? Well, just a simple uh, list comprehension. Give me all the elements in the list that are smaller than x. And how do I find all the elements that are larger? Well, give me all the, all the elements in the list that's, that are larger. And as uh, Graham says here, this is probably the simplest implementation of quicksort that you can imagine. And then, of course, we have to add that this is not really um, the implementation of quicksort because essential in the, in the real implementation of quicksort is that you do it in situ, that you're not using, um, that you're using the same memory of the list, so you're, you're really um, updating the list to sort it. But what this algorithm shows you, or what this function shows you, is the, in the, is the underlying algorithm, how the elements are sorted, which is a slightly different concern then how you kind of update them in place. Boring you again and again and again to drive home the point that evaluation in functional programming is unfolding definitions. And we will apply that the same here to understand how quicksort works. We can look at the definition and just unfold each step and drive it through um, until we have the uh, final answer. And let's abbreviate quicksort as Q. So the quicksort of this list, it's a non-empty list, so what I have to do, I have to pick out the first element and then quicksort all the smaller ones, quicksort all the bigger ones and stick X in the middle. Exactly what we show here. Give me all the elements that are smaller, all the elements that are bigger, stick X in the middle and sort the ones on the left and the right. The one on the left, again, non-empty list, what do I do? Take two, split the list in all the ones that are smaller, all the ones that are bigger, and then stick two in the middle. For quicksort four or five, I do the same, take four, split the list in all the ones that are smaller and all the ones that are bigger, and stick four in the middle. And here you see why people love pure functional languages so much for parallelism. And if you want to learn more about that, look at Simon Peyton Jones's homepage. He has lots of interesting papers about parallel Haskell and nested data parallelism and so on. This simple example here shows why. Because in this tree you see that I can independently sort 2, 1 and 4, 5. Why is that? Because there's no dependencies. These expressions can be evaluated by themselves. There are no global side effects. These things don't change any underlying state. They're just, you can evaluate them all by themselves. And that is the reason that I kept kind of, you know, showing you these examples. Where, oh, you said, oh, Eric, why do you show again and again how I can execute an expression by just unfolding? 
Well, it pays off here because you can now take these expressions and fold, unfold them in parallel. No problem, because there will be never any kind of communication, either implicitly or explicitly, or maybe explicitly, but never implicitly, that's the important thing. And so you can run them in parallel. As this thing shows here, so here you see, I can now even execute these four things in parallel and then uh, sort my list. And this is a, is a very, very important slide that shows the power of lazy and pure functional programming. Because you have abstracted over the order of evaluation, it means that the runtime can pick an order of evaluation, including one where it does things at the same time, including where it introduces parallelism. That is okay, because that is how the semantics of the language is defined. And there is no other language than Haskell, as far as I know, that has, is pure and lazy wh wh that allows you to do that. In all other languages, you can do this thing, but you have to be careful as a programmer, because if I run two things in parallel and they have side effects or they share state, you know, things might go different than when I execute them sequentially. In Haskell, you always know that it's okay. There's no difference that you can observe between executing something in parallel or executing something sequentially, as long as you're not using monads and, and other um, things like that. But again there, um, when we will talk about monads, you will see that in that case you couldn't execute it like this. So the type system kind of guarantees that you can run these things in parallel, which is a quite remarkable um, thing. Okay, exercises. Um, I won't go into the exercises. Um, you can find them online uh, when you look at the slides. But all of these are, again, to define functions over lists um, using recursion. And these are all kind of priming the pump for next lecture where we talk about higher order functions, where we will talk about, we'll see that we have defined, you know, I don't know how many exercises and how many functions, recursive functions over lists that all look the same. What do I do for the empty list? What do I do when I go recursive? What do I do for the empty list? What do I do recursive? What do I do for the empty list? What do I do recursive? But the rest of these functions is exactly the same. So what we will do is we will define a single higher order function that captures exactly that pattern. And that um, now allows us to de easily define uh, recursive functions over list or over any other recursive data structure without having to use recursion. So we've abstracted over recursion. And that is what uh, imperative languages kind of do with loops. Instead of having to define something using recursion, they give you a loop as a special case. What we will see is that instead of having loops, we will define a, a, a higher order function. So again, thank you very much. This was lecture six. See you at uh, Lucky 7 next week. Thank you.